Hey folks, welcome to the Mediocre Cover Band Guitar. Hello, where did you come from? Come here. Don't be shy, come on. Come on. Hey, little fella. Guy. So, how's everybody doing? Um, going to do something a little different today and answer some questions. And uh, just review some comments that came in over the last little bit. Uh, nothing bad, just more or less questions and, and opinions that people wanted my response on, and I feel like maybe I should do that. So when I had the whole Stevie Ray Vaughan effect uh, backlash, and it took a couple of weeks to not do a video or even look at my channel or look at YouTube, really, for that matter, I had an email come in from a gentleman named Bill, and uh, Bill watches the videos. He watches all of the video. like He just doesn't watch the first two minutes and then go, ah, fuck this guy. He probably says, fuck this guy, but uh, he watches the videos, and he watches them to the end because he comments on things that I've said at the end of the video sometimes. So that's how I know. I always leave something in there so I know when somebody makes a comment. But anyway, the question he had was about guitar players just starting off and wondering if I thought people could actually, from day one, the first day they pick up a guitar, learn by watching the YouTube videos, you know, taking advantage of that. And I would imagine, to some degree, you can. I mean, I know things would have kick-started stuff for us young fellows like myself. I'm going to be 52 in a few days. So um, we had fast forward and rewind. I was of that generation. I can only imagine what it was like with the vinyl, doing the needle on the record, trying to get back to that part. CDs might have even been a bit more tangly. That's a, an expression we use here. I don't know if anybody else uses it. It just means it's just a little bit more inconvenient. Um, one thing about the CDs is you could slow them down. And I guess you could with vinyl, too. But anyway, um, I think there are benefits to it there. But I think one of the things that I, I kind of went down a little bit of a, a rabbit hole on it that I discovered was that a lot of lessons aren't done chronologically or you can't find them where it's in a row, like where it starts off one day saying this is your A chord and this is your D chord and this is the notes and this is why. And then it goes into another succession of these are other chords, like you'll get so many and then that's it. I think that that's a bit of a problem. The other thing is, I feel like if you're doing it that way, you can cut corners. One of the great things about having a teacher in the very early days for me is that if I didn't do the work, they would bust your chops when you went back the next week. And uh, that's why you had a whole week. You know what I mean? And uh, you'd, you'd go back and they'd say, you didn't do the work. You know, like you're wasting your folks' money. You need to do the work during the week. That's what the week is for. I'm not going to do up lesson plans and write things out and tab stuff up if you're not going to learn it. So then you felt bad, and you went home the next time, and you learned it, and you went back prepared because you were afraid of getting in trouble, even though the person really had no authority over you. They go to your folks and say, like, you're wasting your, your money because this kid's not going to learn. He's just cutting corners. And that's one thing. The other part of that was, he said, like, you know, he didn't feel that people are truly self-taught and you're learning something from somewhere and somebody. And I got to 100 percent agree with that statement. Even if you're just jamming with somebody and you pick up a chord progression or blues turnaround or anything like that, you're actually learning from somebody. You've, you've learned that from somebody else. And you're learning when you jam with people, timing and things like that. Those are, I think, things that are kind of lost with a lot of new guys starting out is that... It goes way beyond learning modes and scales and what this guy's doing and that guy's doing. You know, if you want to actually get out and play in a band, you need to have timing. You need to learn how to fit all that in and not play ahead of the beat or behind or drag, as they like to say in a recording studio. You don't want to drag the beat. So there's those things, too, that you have to learn. And you're learning those by playing with other musicians and you're picking up things. And even if you're learning from records, you're learning your chords from that person who recorded it. So it's not just a matter of... Uh, I learned every single thing on my own. I didn't. You know, it probably looks like that way, <laughs> but I didn't. I did have help along the way. And to, still to this day, you know, friends will come over and say things like, well, why don't you do it this way? This is easier way of doing that, you know. And that's all cool. And it works, you know. <laughs> so I don't think you can be totally self-taught. Um, I don't think people are totally self-taught. And I think that... Um, as for YouTube, yeah, I think you're going to cut a lot of corners. I think you can do it. I think you have to be really motivated to do it and want to do it. 
Um, another comment, I did a video on this four years ago, but I'll do like a recap of it because it is important. A uh, gentleman said maybe I, it was a comment on a video, it wasn't an email, and it said maybe you should, uh, I think it was the video I did on band loyalty. Um, why don't you do a video on learning your stuff before rehearsal, coming into practice prepared and knowing the material and not trying to learn it while you're there. And I did a video on that. That's important because it cuts time down and allows the band to focus on getting the material down. Bigger pieces of music, and if you're busy, at least go in with the nuts and bolts so you can get through the song. Also, you need to contact the singer at some point and say, does this work in this key, or do you think it's going to be too hard? Uh, to sing because you might have to transpose that stuff and if you learn everything note for note and you have to you know if a song's got a lot of open strings on it for guys that haven't been playing a long time it might be tricky to actually transpose that down to a different key and find the notes that are half step up full step up whatever um, or the key itself right it might take you a little bit longer so practice your stuff before you go into rehearsal it's a good idea I gotta agree with it music snobs Another one that came through. Um, why are, Why do we have them? Nobody really knows. We don't need them. It's like the common cold. Always around, but we don't want it. Um, and there are different types of music snobs. You get some guys that, they don't play an instrument, they just listen to music, and they go out and they watch bands, and they criticize things. We did the whole bedroom guitar players and uh, bitter guitar players. And some reasons, I guess, that they get bitter is they're just snobs in general, entitlement. Uh, some people, it's more bitter than music snobbery. It's like, well, I lost all my gigs or I got kicked out of my band because I didn't have uh, the ability to, to be in there or I was dragging them down or whatever. And then they take it out on every band that plays places they've been booted out of, you know, like I said in the Bitter Guitar Player video. And some people are just judgmental. Uh, some people are amazing musicians and feel like they're stuck in this one place and then you're advancing and they feel like they should be, you know, where you are when it comes to playing out and having some sort of whatever you want to, how you determine success. And they feel like, that should, well, that should be me. We had a guy, he's back again, but we had a guy in the city for years. He put a band together, undercut the shit out of everybody, badmouth everybody, which is like the catalyst for a lot of these videos that I do. Uh, undercut everybody, uh, shit on everybody get the gigs and then the bands break up because he was basically a shit mop and um unfortunately most of the musicians that played with him would carry on his reputation even though they were nice guys right um but he was a music snob and that's what he would do he would go in you know he went into a bar he had a job hiring bands and he said he was going to take care of all the riffraff and by taking care of all the riffraff he meant hiring himself as much as possible so i don't know why i can only surmise on that music snobbery comes from possibly people losing gigs people feeling that they should be further than what they are because they're amazing musicians um all that stuff you know what i mean um and entitlement just growing up you know there it's not just music it's not just playing you know it's uh, or listening it's just entitlement that everything they do is better than what you do because it's them you know and and i know people like that i guess we all know people like that the gear snobs who bring over the music snobbery are always the worst, in my opinion. <laughs> like I said, I, I told the story before. I knew a guy who bashed a guy's playing, like brilliant player, one of the best players in our city. And um, anyway, like in terms of uh, of like tone, his ability writes his own songs and things, and they sound great. But this guy comes to me and says, "Yeah, I went down and seen so and so play. This is when the Fat Cat was there at the Fat Cat. I didn't think much of him. Sure, he was only playing an old Squire." Yeah, Fender Squire guitar, right? Like, that's how he measured a person's ability on the instruments by the equipment they owned, right? And if you go back to the 80s and you look at a lot of these country guys, yeah, they were playing American tellies, but they are playing them through probably solid-state, cheaper PV bandits, and they sounded amazing. So don't give me that shit. And guys playing on homemade guitars and stuff, it's, it's fucking ridiculous. So I don't know. We don't need it. Fuck off. Um, another question was about music communities, and it said, you seem to be disgruntled with your music community. This person said, I totally get it. Um, I'm disgruntled with mine. Why do you think these things are happening in music right now in this province? And the economy plays a little bit of a role. People aren't going out as much, but 
because you can stay home and buy a shit ton of food and booze for what you're paying for a drink at the bar and a cover charge. And uh, so this is these are the things that are killing our community, right? That that's that's step one, and that started happening probably about six years ago. Um, we've seen the demise of it. Younger people don't socialize the way we did. Um, we got a 28 year old here, not here. He's out married and got his own family started. But when he was 19 and of age to go out drinking, all we ever saw was the back of his head. Him and his buddies were trying every dive bar they could find just just for fun, right? And uh, just to have that experience of being in the dive bar um, and going out and checking out local entertainment and seeing bands and coming back and saying, hey, Craig, I saw this band last night. They were, they were really good and whatever. Um, the 22-year-olds, not so much. Um, my uh, biological daughter and my stepson have no interest in being in a bar. Um, I don't even know if they've ever been in one. Um, it's just not their thing. They hang out with their friends. Everything is at home. Uh, either, you know, they're both post-secondary during the weekend. He's, you know, with his buddies and they're doing the video games and she's got a boyfriend now. Fuck me. Anyway, um, and all that shit. But, uh, yeah, I can't get over that, right? That. Anyway, they don't go out. Well, that's one thing. The other thing that's destroying our music community are the people in it. Lack of support. From the actual community is one thing, but there's no excuse for the lack of support and shittiness, shitbaggery from shit mops that's going on. Like, and I, and I said it before, I, I can't get into like the undercutting and the bad mouth and that. There's another problem too is that you got guys now putting three and four bands together. We did this one on Can You Play, same venue and whatever, and this is killing your scene. Um, you got guys putting three and four bands together with different people just so they can hog all of the weekend nights out of our, like I once said, and I guess this person's seen the video, you can't do all the gigs. Well, apparently you can. The only thing is, is that if you're going to do it, all three or four of your bands should be good and have great set lists, not drive people out of the bar. Because eventually you're going to see a bar close, especially if you got an owner who makes bad decisions. And along with that, you driving people out of the bar and not bringing in any revenue or helping to bring in any revenue. You're killing the scene for everybody. We covered that. But the people in it, yeah, they're not as supportive. One person commented on that video and labeled these guys as the gatekeepers. And that's exactly what I feel like they are, the gatekeepers. They're uh, definitely, definitely hurting the scene right so i think a club should only hire a person in their band once that's an opinion of mine and give if you're going to have more than one band playing in your bar you need to have variety there as well okay and that seems to be lacking right now <laughs> another question that i'm going to answer was and i feel like ann flanders or fucking dear abby on this one was about relationships and it said um me and my girlfriend, we moved in together. We've been in a serious relationship for about a year now. She knew I was a musician, but now that we're living together, some things are starting to pop up that uh, aren't really working for us. When I play here in the city, um, she's fine with me playing. Uh, but when I go to towns around just outside the city and have to be gone for the night, there's always an issue because she can't go. We can always get a sitter for her son if we're in town, but overnight would require her not to be home, obviously, and she's unable to attend. Therefore, there's always a problem when I leave and when I get back home. So, dude, I that's a rough one. That is a very good question in one sense when you're starting a band up of any sorts, whether you're in an original band or a cover band or you're a solo artist or anybody who's seeking live music if you're not going to be happy in your town and some towns are small and you don't have the means to play every weekend so therefore you have to look for shows outside of your town which requires travel and being gone for like a couple nights and um i guess you know there's a lot of temptation man when you're out in a band you're on the stage not so much you know for good looking musicians i can only imagine how it is for those guys you know, um, and younger, obviously. Um, I guess there is some temptation about being out of town and um, 
having that, you know, there in front of you and having a hotel room and not being around with the missus. The only advice I can do to kind of give you is you're going to have to sit down and talk to her about it and reassure her that you're there for the music. And people are like, oh, an idiot. But that always doesn't work. You're going to also need to communicate when you're out of town as much as possible. Um, when I was in that situation, I would text right before I went on stage. I would have a conversation during the, between the break on, on the first and second sets. Third set, I'd let her know. I was off stage. When we got back to the hotel, I'd call and uh, or FaceTime, things like that. That was a long time ago. And they eventually ended up working themselves out. Um, I think once as you get kind of comfortable, the other thing is, too, is that she might feel that she's home and you're out having fun. And she's stuck in just being there in the house with these responsibilities and you get a break and she doesn't. That's the other part of it, too. It's not all what you think. It's not all you're going to be man about the town and have, like, strippers and cocaine up in the hotel room. I'm sure there are bands out there doing it, and I hope she doesn't watch that. But I think things have changed as well. People are a little bit more socially uh, aware of things like STDs and, uh, you know, realize that when somebody's drunk, you shouldn't do certain things. And, and that's as far as I'm going to get on it, you know. It should have probably never happened before, but I think we have more awareness on the rights and wrongs of all that now, too. So you need to assure uh, her that you're not up to anything. Keep constant contact, and then the decision has to be made. Can your relationship weather it, or do you give up music? And that's that. Uh, anyway, guys, that's it for me. If you sat through this one, God love you, because I feel like I did a TED Talk or some shit today. Um, don't know how many more of these I'll do, but I do get a lot of questions and a lot of comments where people make suggestions. And uh, I'm just trying to be a better host. Anyway, I'm going to go finish that beer now. And uh, he was good enough to show up. Can't let him down. All right. Cheers, folks. <laughs>